18, verses 18 to 30. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with human beings is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brother or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Please be seated. Good morning, church. It's great to be here with you. Uh, as you can see, I'm not Ryan. Uh, he's away at marriage camp. He's actually leading that, so we should be praying for that. Uh, but I have the honour and privilege of bringing you God's word today and to continue the series in Luke. So we're looking at the passage that we just read. Uh, but before that, we'll pray. Please bear your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord God, for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you continue to do today. Uh, we just ask for your help, Lord God, understanding your word as, we, yeah, as we're sitting beneath uh, this passage today. Uh, please open our hearts and minds, Lord God, to, to give us a clear understanding. Uh, please humble us, God, and yeah, we just want to exalt you. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> For as long as humans have existed, we've been asking questions. We ask questions every day, don't we? Most of them, pretty basic. How are you today? How's your weekend been? Uh, does this look good on me? There are an unlimited amount of questions that we ask every day. I'm sure you could think of examples. But not all questions are created equal, are they? There are some basic questions and there are some not so basic. Some of these have been debated thousands of years and they continue to be discussed today. Philosophers have tried to answer these deeper questions. Names like Plato, Aristotle, Frederick Nietzsche, they're all well known today because they try and answer these deeper questions. These deeper questions tend to gnaw at us as human beings. The religions of the world, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, or any other you may think of, there's actually approximately 4,000 religions in the world today, so I'm guessing there'll be 4,000 different answers. These religions claim to provide an understanding of these big questions. What is the meaning of life? How are we meant to live? What happens after death? Today we'll see what the Son of God has to say. Maybe you're here today wrestling with these questions yourself. You would not call yourself a Christian and you thought you'd come to Forbes Baptist to see what answers you might find here. If that is you, we are very glad you're here. But to those of us who are already a part of Forbes Baptist Church, I want to ask us what our mission statement is. You can actually answer it out loud, if you know it. Good. Close. Very good. I've got it on the slide if we need it. There we go. A family of God's people maturing in Christ and reaching out into the community. 
I've left out existing. That was a test. Existing for the glory of God. So it's our job to go out with the message of the gospel and Jesus, yeah, Jesus' words. So if we are going to do what we say there, we too need to have an answer to the question in our text today. So the passage we come to today is often known as the, the rich young ruler or the rich in the kingdom, which I think is a bit more helpful a title. Now this event that Luke has recorded for us today is recorded by Matthew and Mark as well. I've got the passages up on there for reference if you'd like to read them later. I strongly suggest you do that. There they are there. And it's also one of the more preached upon passages of, of the Gospels. And the reason for that, I think, is because it, it plainly asks one of these deep questions. One, one of these questions that we want answered. How do I get eternal life? Now that's something everyone in this room needs to get the answer right to. And everyone out of, outside of these walls as well. But before we look at the question, the, the answer to the question, let's look at the man asking it. So look with me at verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now we're not given a great deal about this man. We're told that he's a ruler. Now, most likely he's in charge of a, a local synagogue which at the time of this writing would have made him a very important man. Someone held up in high regard, a man of high status. If we look just back a few verses to the passage, yeah, just before our passage today, we find Luke 18, 15 to 17. And in this, we have an account of Jesus calling the little children to come to him. But this is just, just after the disciples have rebuked these children as they were seen as not worthy or, or not important enough. Our passage today, like Luke 18 and 15 to 17, is primarily concerned with the kingdom of God and eternal life. If you, if you have a look at your Bibles there, at verse 18, and then have a look at verse all the way down to 30, what word do we see repeated there? Eternal life. That's right. So Jesus' response... Oh, sorry. Let's look at the question this ruler asks in Jesus' response, verses 18 to 20. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. Now Jesus' response might seem a little odd to us at first reading. Verse 19 is often pointed to and used by those who are actually opposing Christianity. They will point to this verse and say, look, here, Jesus himself is denying his own divinity. This is common uh, with Muslim apologists. But as we've travelled through our sermon series in Luke, we see that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not denying his divinity here. Jesus' response is doing two things. Firstly, He's rebuking this young man's empty flattery. He's misguided. And secondly and more importantly, he's highlighting the standard of what good really is. What, what good really means. Now we still struggle with this today, don't we? What does it mean to be good? I'll give a second for you to answer that in your own mind. What does it mean to be good? Now, if we walk down Rankin Street today asking people how they think they can get to heaven, I'm guessing there would be two responses given more than, more than yeah, any other. One would probably be there is no heaven. And I, see, I think secondly would be just try to be good enough. If we just do good enough to tip the scales. Jesus is not denying his divinity here. To borrow the words of R.C. Sproul, Jesus is saying to this man, Why do you call me good? You have no idea what good is. 
And we see that he doesn't have any idea of what good is. Look at verse 2. Verse 21. He says, All these I've kept since I was a boy. Now, before we're too hard on this man coming to Jesus, he's at least asking the question, isn't he? In Mark's account of this same event, found in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, we read, oh, we've got a slide, we read, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, and he fell on his knees before him. This ruler, although in a position of power and authority, being someone who people usually came to for answers, was desperate enough to run and fall at his feet. And that's in front of a crowd of people. From the account given to us so far, if we didn't know the end, this is looking pretty promising, isn't it? But this ruler's understanding of the law was common in the days of Judaism, and sadly still is today. You may have heard the term legalism said before. The Apostle Paul expresses the same understanding before he came to Christ in Philippians chapter 3. I have another slide. particularly down the highlighted red. Now, this idea of being able to keep the Ten Commandments, to satisfy God, to be good enough, to call yourself righteous, it's everywhere. And if we're reaching out into the community with the gospel as we're commanded to do, we will absolutely see it. If you're here today and you think that the message of the Bible is to just try and be a good enough person, And God will be happy with that. Again, I'm very glad you're here. Because we need to say that that's not it. Before we look at verse 22, if you're wondering what the purposes of the Ten Commandments are, I have a helpful slide from the New City Catechism questions. Sorry, there's not many more slides to go. There we go. I'll leave that up if you want further reference or to write it down. So we're in verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. I said earlier in this account, this account was looking promising, wasn't it? The young man comes to the right teacher, He's asked one of the most important questions we can ask. But sadly, it's here where we see this event beginning to turn. Jesus tests the man's statement in verse 21. That he's kept the commandments since he was a boy. Now, Jesus' comment, you still lack one thing, reads like sarcasm. He knows where this man's heart is. He knows that he's not kept the commandments even though this ruler has convinced himself he has. The first commandment of the Decalogue reads, you shall have no other gods before me. This man has other gods, as we'll see. This ruler convinced of his own righteousness hasn't even made it past the first commandment. Look at verse 23. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Why was he sad? Because he was very wealthy. Jesus warned warned us of the dangers of riches choking out the word of God earlier in our sermon series. It's chapter 8. This man had it all. He was exceedingly wealthy. Anything he desired, he could get. He was young. He had time to enjoy it. He had the respect of his community. He was religious. He had a knowledge of God. He was at the feet of the perfect teacher asking the perfect question. But this is tragic. Unlike the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee at the beginning of chapter 18, he does not come in a manner of repentance. Rather than being humbled, He's convinced of his own self-righteousness. 
He's convinced that eternal life, the kingdom of God, is something he can earn. He does not value eternal life with God as more valuable than he has in the now. So unfortunately, he's unwilling to hear Jesus' words. Now, if you're a regular here at Forbes Baptist, it might, it might make you recall the words of Luke chapter 14, verse 33. I have that up on a slide. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This man had his opportunity to leave what was holding him back from the kingdom. He's gone now and we have our opportunity to learn from the reading of this account today. Is there anything that we count as more worthy than following God? Is there anything we count as more valuable, more important? We really need to answer this question. Silently pray to yourself. Ask God to reveal it if you're unsure now. Ask this question later after the service. Is there anything coming in between me and following God? Look with me at verse 24 to 25. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for, the eye, uh, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you've been with us throughout our sermon series in Luke, we have seen that Jesus has not sugarcoated the difficulty of following him. We've seen people making excuses why they can't follow him now, but will at a more convenient time later. Jesus has told him, told us that we must desire him more than even our closest relationships and even life itself. That we must count the cost and be willing to pay everything to follow him. That we must deny ourselves, take up our cross and walk. He's certainly not hidden the difficulty of what he's been calling his people to do. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, some commentators talk about this referring to an actual gate, but Jesus is simply giving an illustration to stress his point. Riches and material goods can make us self-reliant, proud. Now, remember this teaching is completely flipping the understanding of the time on its head. The rich at the time were seen as closest to God. They were seen as the most blessed of God. This crowd now would have no idea what they'd be struggling to understand. Look with me at verse 26. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? We can almost feel their confusion at all they've heard. Jesus' words have had their desired effect. They can't see how anyone is saved, how anyone could inherit the kingdom of God. If this teacher, if what this teacher is saying is true. Now, at the, be at the beginning of this sermon, I told you that the Bible does not just teach us to be a good person. It's not about hitting a standard of goodness, keeping the Ten Commandments well enough that we can get into this kingdom. We can't. Jesus' words in verse 27 gives us the answer to our question. Look with us. Verse 27, Jesus replied, What is impossible with human beings is possible with God. Now if you take anything from this sermon today, I'd like it to be two things. I want you to again ask yourself, is there anything that I would not give up to follow God? Is there anything I hold as more important than eternal life with God? And secondly, it's Jesus' words in verse 27. What is impossible with human beings is possible with God. It's in this verse that we see grace. The grace that makes heaven possible. 
This man came before Jesus thinking he was doing pretty good. There might just be one or two more things I can add and I'm there. Maybe that's what you came thinking today. Sometimes we can fool ourselves into thinking we're doing good. I hope it's clear now that it's not what you can do to inherit eternal life. The Bible teaches what we read in our passage today. It is completely by God's grace through his son's death on the cross. Through his resurrection from the dead. dead, That what was impossible for us he has done if we place our faith in him. What can we do to earn ourselves into heaven? Nothing. It can't be earned. It is complete and undeserved grace for those who trust in Christ. Now it's our prayer that you believe on Jesus Christ today. Don't, please don't hold on to things of this world. Please don't exchange what little this world offers for eternal life with God. Now if you have further questions, our church family would love to, to speak to you. We have elders here who would love to answer any of the questions you have. But please, please don't walk away. Please bow your heads in prayer. Father God, there are so many lost in this world. There's so much pain and suffering, Lord God, but you have sent your son to make a way where there was no way, Lord. Father, we pray that, yeah, we can go out with your message to those who maybe think that you, yeah, maybe think that all you want is for us to just try to be good enough, Lord God, to, yeah, just to tick off these boxes. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you reveal this to them and that we can go out with the message of your son and his sacrifice to bring us back to you. Amen.